But we're happy to see all of you today uh, to help us celebrate the reopening of Hayes Hall, home for the School of Architecture and Planning. And as I like to say, nay, environmental design, um, which has um, been here for the last 40 years and is well set up for the next 40 years at least. Today's symposium was organized as an opportunity to reflect on the trajectory of this school, to look back and to look forward, and to focus on some of the big ideas and ma major preoccupations of the school then, now, and into the future. Um, I think there's nothing essentially contradictory about celebration and critical self-reflection. So we're going to try and do both. Um, in breakout discussions that will follow this plenary discussion, Hadass Steiner and some of her colleagues will explore the ways in which our uh, scholars pursue critical practices in architecture, planning, and design through historical research, speculative endeavors, and criticism. That will be... <laughs> I just had a note that says, who are you? <laughs> I'm nobody, who are you? Said Emily Dickinson. Um, Bradshaw Hovey, I'm the uh, uh, associate uh, research professor and uh, um, senior fellow of the UB Regional Institute. Um, and uh, I have been the organizer of this um, modest endeavor. Um, in the breakout discussions that will follow this plenary, um, Hadass Steiner and her, some of her colleagues will explore. Oh, I already read that one. That will be that will be in this room. There's an error on your program. It's not in 401. It's in 403. Um, a second session to be led by Martha Bohm um, will examine the ways in which international experiences for our students have contributed to the educational process. That will be just across the hall in room 402. Li Yin will help us look at the centrality of ecological commitments in the work we have done over the decades and what we look forward to in the decades to come. That's also across the hall in room 401 uh, immediately after this, this session. Uh, finally, I will lead a discussion about the role of research as a vital element in both education and professional practice and how to expand the contribution it makes to better environments. That will be one flight down in room 309. In the second session, starting at 3.30, Mark Shepard will facilitate a discussion of the ways in which our conceptions of practice have been expanded beyond what we conventionally think of as architecture. That's downstairs in room 309. Rob Silverman will lead a discussion about the ways in which design and planning address our concern with equity and social justice. That's right here in Hayes Hall 403, which, as you might imagine, has become an address of choice for people around campus who have to hold meetings somewhere. Um, with help from Chris Romano, another session will address the traditions of making and engaging our material culture uh, in the work of the school. That will be across the hall in 401. And I will lead a second panel examining the ways in which project work and engagement with clients in the community has been a primary mode of education and service throughout the life of the school. Um, it started that way, it continued that way, and um, it is that way today. Bob Shibley, as you know, is dean of the school since 2011, but he has been here at UB since 1982, 34 years ago and served as chair in architecture through 1990, subsequently as director and founder of the Urban Design Project, later as director of the UB Regional Institute, leader of the UB campus planning effort from 2007 to 2010, um, and since then as campus architect. The impact of his work on the school, the university, the, and the city region has been profound. The Buffalo Niagara, uh, Buffalo, that Buffalo Niagara has an explicit framework for planning is in large part the result of Bob's unflagging effort, deft leadership, and vision. That the School of Architecture and Planning has a fantastic new home in this building is also centrally a result of his vision and leadership. He has worked hard today. Um, 
and otherwise to share credit for this accomplishment. That's one of his tricks. But I think what we celebrate today has a lot to do with someone who said to himself every day for half a decade, we're going to renew Hall, Hayes Hall, and it's going to be great. So it is, and with that, I give you Bob Shively. Well, that's embarrassing. <laughs> give me back my water. Now that we know who you are. <laughs> um, 50 years ago, next March, the SUNY trustees voted to amend the system-wide master plan, which was then significantly less than 64 campuses, um, to create a school of architecture. The proposal had been pushed by the local architectural community those of you who were here and here then, thank you. That push was an important part of this, and the local community was hungry for skilled professionals to staff their drawing boards. When John Eberhard was here uh, some years back, many approached him, thanking him for the opportunity to study architecture here because they wouldn't be architects without that opportunity. It was one of John's tearful moments. But it had been really brought to fruition. All of this came through the vision of UB President Martin Meyerson. You may recall Meyerson was um, a uh, uh, president at the University of California, Berkeley, and was brought to Buffalo uh, by the administration that structured the State University of New York at Buffalo in part of the Rockefeller era of the construction of SUNY. And Meyerson, whose previous job was, sorry, I got it wrong, was dean of the College of Environmental Design at the University of California, Berkeley, was brought here to construct a Berkeley of the East. I've always been a little uncomfortable with that. I'm much more interested and would take some pride in that assertion of Berkeley of the East when our colleagues at Berkeley refer to themselves as the Buffalo of the West. <clears throat> we laugh about that now, I do too, but you know what? It's not such a stretch. This university and this school have a tremendous amount to contribute to the world, even as we also contribute to where we live. And it's in that search for how we elevate still again the standing of this university internationally, that architecture and planning have found new roles and new services and new ways of engaging intellectually in the process and practices of placemaking. Local practitioners seemed to hope at the time this was all happening for a school to provide conventional training. Both SUNY leadership and Meyerson in particular and his multiple provosts um, and this is a kind of a who's who list. Eric Larrabee, Warren Bennis, and Carl Willenbrock knew they wanted to create something to respond to discontent in the profession and in society at large about the quality of America's built environment. Maybe Larrabee wrote to his colleagues at one point, we won't even call it the School of Architecture. Maybe it will have a different name. The task at hand is larger than the narrow term architecture describes. Many of us would expand the term. Some would simply add layers around and connect them to it. That might really be a semantic argument. Meyerson hired John Paul Eberhard, then a leader at the National Bureau of Standards, running one of the largest architectural research projects in American history. He was to be our first dean. In an early encounter at an AIA chapter meeting, one slightly indignant Buffalo member demanded, what I want to know, Dean Eberhard, is are you going to teach these students how to draw? John shot back in a less than diplomatic way, no, I'm going to teach them how to think. And then apparently got up and walked out of the room. 
I come from a different world and a different kind of sensibility. Um, I feel some respect for his answer, but think it could have been added to as a yes and I'm going to teach him how to think as opposed to no. <laughs> but but we'll, we'll keep working on those sensibilities as a school and in our relationship with our colleagues in the field. The graduate architecture program in the new school was built around project work for clients outside the university. A little known secret is that that's how they funded themselves. And not without some friction with the local professional community. There wasn't much of a budget for the new school of uh, environmental design, architecture and environmental design. They believed that the problems of the built environment would be solved. That is to say, they did this on purpose. They saw real value in the project-based engagement, as we'll talk more about in some of the sessions later. Um, and they also thought the problems of the built environment would not be solved by architects alone, but by multidisciplinary teams which environmental, with environmental designers would coordinate and lead. They saw the profession in expansive terms, focusing initially not on buildings, but on building systems. Eberhard would tell his students that getting a degree in architecture was good for a lot more than just becoming an architect. Um, those of us who are architects are only modestly offended by that assertion. <laughs> just architecture? I don't think so. Early faculty and students understood that research needed to be an integral part of professional practice. Design and planning were infinitely iterative processes in which evaluation after the fact of building was the starting point for the next act of building. What a concept. We learn from every act of making and we play it forward. Imagine if we took that seriously as a discipline as a matter of routine. Our founders believed in a generic but robust multi-step approach to problem solving. They weren't afraid of that word, even as they embraced the full richness and cultural contributions of architecture. They moved, clearly, from problem identification and analysis to solution generation, testing, comparison, selection to implementation and post-implementation evaluation and back to problem identification. All entirely too modernist uh, and, and structuralist for most of us today, yet clearly an important part of making good places over time. They got their hands dirty too. They engaged in the materiality of the design process with gusto, for example, in the development of a very serious practice about fabricating furniture from cheap hollow core doors. It was the environment of the school for uh, close to a decade. Such a practice was a matter of necessity in the early years, as the flush 1960s gave way to the recessionary 70s, and there wasn't much more money and what there was went to salaries, not buildings, equipment, and furniture. South Campus was otherwise bursting at the seams in anticipation someday of a move to um, a consolidated campus um, slated for Amherst. We could have a long conversation about that, but maybe we'll avoid that today. The environmental design program made a, made a camp in a former tavern at the corner of Bailey and Highgate. The rest of the school occupied a seedy, in quotes, two-story office building on Elmwood in Kenmore. Undergraduate architecture classes were held in borrowed space in Buffalo State College. And some say a telephone company building at Jefferson and East Delavan. The fact that we don't know for sure means we really don't know where all the school was <laughs> in those days. Um, Bradshaw has been commissioned to write this history more fully and completely. We look forward to his, his discovering those sites. Pictures, please. The Buffalo Organization for Social and Technical Innovation's first home was in a nondescript single-story office building on Kenmore Avenue across from St. Joe's. Building Science, Inc. 
was in a house on Elmwood, where the Lexington Co-op now stands. Much to the eventual chagrin of our senior leadership at the university, those two entities actually contributed significantly to the financial well-being of the school. Um, absent that, I'm not sure we would have survived. <laughs> David and Bunny Stieglitz's Environmental Design Associates was another house on Symphony Circle. Only Eberhard had an office in official university space. None of this was UB inventory. And John was in Hayes Hall. So maybe you could say, we started here, <laughs> and we're still here. Um, this was also, at that time, the home for the president and other administrative functions. In 1973, the School of Architecture and Environmental Design moved into Bethune Hall, or the Meter Building, and four years later, when the administration moved to Capon Hall on the North Campus, Harold Cohen led the school into Hayes Hall. It's mind-boggling to think of the kind of distance between that scattered and fragmented vagabond experience, squatting in otherwise unwanted real estate, or even more unified school occupying the industrial meter building, or the unrenovated Hayes Hall, and the school we celebrate today. 700 students in five major degree programs, a larger and growing faculty with a burgeoning base of sponsored research and creativity, historic and state-of-the-art facilities, and a manifest impact on the city, the region, professions, academia, and the world. We are local and global, but we are not the same school that we started almost 50 years ago. Maybe, maybe Bradshaw Hovey has the hard work of researching a history of the school, and what he is finding is that the mature enterprise is very recognizable as a product of those original intentions. We are not the same school, but the knowledge base of our field and our profession, knowledge broadly conceived, the culture and world making of architecture and planning and place making professionals can be seen in the core seeds of that kind of rough engagement with architecture in those early years. We can do better is the message. And a theory, a hypothesis we're working at today and perhaps through the history of the school is that you know, how far does the acorn fall from the tree? As you think about this lineage, is there an intellectual project that is made manifest decade over decade in the School of Architecture, first and environmental design, and then the School of Architecture and urban planning? And in that trajectory, I think we'll do some exploration. Where we've been, where we are now, and where we might go. Um, all of this informs a robust opportunity to take still further significant transformative steps for this school in history. So we're going to have some fun today. We'll take this hypothesis. It's easily contested. We are not so monolithic as to be one school. There's, there's various points of view about what constitutes quality and consideration in the whole world of placemaking. But we do have an attitude today, not unlike the attitude that we started with, which is to gather across disciplines and across communities and across cultures, we can do more than we can within each. To make that real, requires the curricular explorations, the intellectual discipline and structure of building what architecture and planning will become. It's an easy metaphor in Buffalo. I don't skate and I don't do hockey, but you know, if you skate to where the puck is, you'll never get there. If you skate to where it's going, you got a chance. We're looking over the course of this symposium to where it's going. 
To help us with this, we, we have this short plenary to bring um, five decades of students um, back from their practice and invite them to reflect on um, what they thought they were doing <laughs> the decade they were here and uh, what they may have learned that proved valuable to them in the execution of their various practices and ways of working in the world. And finally, whether they have some thoughts about, so what, for the next generations of students that we will have the privilege to teach. We're not putting them on the spot. We didn't ask them to prepare slides and hard talk shows. This is, this is literally a kind of effort at conversation. And to take them off the hook, while they represent a student from the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, and the 2010s, five decades, they are not the sole representative or voice for those decades, and many of you will have things to add to what they might have to offer. So let me introduce them in order, and as I call your name, please come up and you get your choice of microphone. <laughs> we'll start in the 1970s with Roland Baer. He is a registered architect, urban designer, and planner in private practice for more than 30 years. He was a 1973 graduate of our Bachelor of Architecture program, and he's a principal at Urban Architecture RB. He also earned the MS Architecture slash Urban Design in our program. Um, Roland holds a master's degree, oh, I'm sorry, that's from, from Columbia University. Um, his work currently at Urban Architecture RB in New York City, but he also has lots of creds with Cooper Robertson and other firms. Cheryl Parker is a 1987 grad of our Bachelor of Arts in Environmental Design program and is currently the Chief Executive Officer of the Urban Explorer, the developer of web-based GIS tools for economic development, workforce development, and urban planning. She also holds graduate degrees in architecture and planning from the University of California, Berkeley, the Buffalo of the East, West, of the West. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Michael Tunkey is with us today. He earned his Bachelor of Professional Studies in 1998. He is a principal at Canon Design and led the establishment of Canon's Shanghai office. Yeah, he speaks Mandarin. Michael is also a Master of Architecture degree from Harvard's Graduate School of Design. Um, 1998 grad. Now as we get further into this, we find some people at least that the faculty might recognize from the past in some really concrete ways. Uh, Laura Cabral came to us in the decade of the 2000s. She is an MUP 2006 graduate. Uh, of urban and regional planning. Laura is the current director of the UB Regional Institute and home of the Urban Design Project and a research associate professor in the school. She has led the institute's work on regional economic development and support of the Regional Economic Development Council in, in, our, in our community and across the state uh, in several other communities. Laura was Knowledge Management Officer for the Oshai Foundation and Director of Planning for the Buffalo Olmstead Parks Conservancy, where we here at the school were her client for an interminable amount of time. <laughs> she also holds a bachelor's degree in English and Psychology from UB. And then finally, in the decade 2010, we have a chance to look forward uh, to uh, Molly Runhan who earned her Bachelor of Environmental Design degree here in 2010. Uh, a Master of Urban Planning from us in 2013 and is one of the very first students in our new PhD program. She also works as a research analyst in support of the Erie County Age-Friendly Communities Initiative, which is also a focus of her doctoral research. So, briefly, couple sentences, key themes that you remember about the intellectual work of your time in school. And we'll offer an opportunity for the group to comment on things they would add to that um, quickly and briskly. We'll start with you, Roland. I'll start with 
something that was quite simple. It was when John was the dean, and this is the first time I've actually been in this building. Um, he started out by saying that we are in a new paradigm. And a new paradigm for us had to do with how one looked at things. And we looked at things that, from a systems point of view, he had us read books like Lewis Mumford, Technique and Civilization, Warren Bennis, we read a lot of Bennis, Peter Drucker, An Age of Discontinuity, and General Systems Theory with Von Bertolanffy. And when John taught this stuff, he would cry. And that was always the kind of the moment that, if you knew John, that was something that was quite regular in his life. Um, but we also had a traditional architectural experience. A lot of the people that were in my class, which was probably one of the earliest classes, also had uh, experience in architecture already. So they had been working for years. So we really didn't need to have the technical aspects of that. And there wasn't that much taught when we were there. But when we started, it was all by hand. So for those of you who know how to use a computer, that was way before our time. I, I graduated 43 years ago, which kind of throws it off a little bit. I didn't think it was that long ago, unfortunately. But I had the, the good pleasure of not only the school itself, but working at Building Science. And we have one of my bosses and one of my teachers here, Pete Horahan. There was Tony Joy, Paul Lasso, who later taught at, where did Paul teach? Ball State. Ball State. And if you've seen all the architectural books by Chang, all those drawings were Paul's drawings. So he had quite a hand. And he used to work with Marcel Breuer. And he would tell me stories when we were there about taking the licensing exam and throwing a tablecloth and putting a bottle of wine and drinking to get everybody off of it. Um, but that was a good experience, because we were doing things like for the National Academy of Science. We um, cataloged all the industrialized building systems, which I had the pleasure of putting together. There were 800 at that time. And at that time, we didn't have computers, so we had the punch cards, and I had to pull it through with a rack. So we're talking about some of the things that you people are lucky you don't have to do. Peter taught, of course, in CPM. All of this was about how one thinks, how one problem solves. So everything that we were learning besides the basic architectural world was how does one understand a problem. And a lot of that had to do with general systems theory, is how do you look at a problem, how do you take it apart, how do you analyze it, how do you repackage it. Um, maybe I should stop at this point. So Cheryl, fast forward 15 years. <clears throat> How do you characterize your experience in the school in terms of intellectual traditions or arcs? Well, um, for me, uh, I mean, a lot of what you just said is also true. Um, these days, uh, lately, I have the privilege of kind of, I've hit middle age, and now I have the privilege of, of looking back and, and people asking me, well, how do, how did you get to be doing what you're doing? Because what I'm doing essentially right now is I'm a computer programmer, and I never touched a computer here. <laughs> I never touched a computer in Berkeley either. Um, but uh, the what happened here had to do with uh, learning how to think, and not just thinking in kind of cerebral terms, but thinking through the heart. Um, so I can always remember L. Price and Magda McHale. Um, making me into their special project, constantly pulling me aside, making sure that um, I was in touch with uh, my t intuition and learning how to trust that. Um, and then I worked uh, for Mike Brill. Um, I, and he, he, on the one hand, he was the funniest person I've ever met. That still stands. On the other hand, he was so amazing at being able to listen. And he listened through empathy. He knew more about the person he was talking to than they actually did. And then he would take that and he would apply that to his research and his work. And then he, he mentored me in learning how to take that and uh, detach myself from problem solving and um, detach myself from the problem and recognize that there are all these different alternatives. There's a pre-designed program that you work. It's, it's a way of lateral thinking, total creativity. And then Bob and Linda took me in at the caucus partnership. And um, it was the same sort of thing. It was building upon that, not just a one-on-one -on -one thing, but doing it in a group through facilitation um, and bringing the group's voice out and uh, forming alternatives that way. 
And it was from this place, all the various places that I've gone since this time, um, I've never come across anything, any institution, any corporation, anything that really touches upon lateral thinking and, uh, and using empathy as a way of knowing. Nice. Thank you. Michael, and your decade, what? Yeah, it's funny, I'm just reacting to these first two because I feel like our decade was very much a hinge between that type of thinking and, a, and then moving to making and a huge emphasis on the body and perspective. So when I think about my time here, I think about uh, first and foremost, Rose Mendez, who was a really important influencer on me. And um, her, her, what her and that group taught us was to take um, you know, the basic fundamentals that we got from people like Beth Talke and the theory they got from Jean LaMarche and many others, but then apply it in a very direct and almost punk rock way to making and thinking. And I think the rise of the perspective in our generation was very important. And I think, you know, going and using the wood shop to the maximum capacity was important. Um, and I think also that generation of professors really taught us to work, work, work. I mean, I just think of, all, I think we all have many all-nighters, but I think our, our group was particularly just focused on if we work hard enough, if we make things, if we use our eyes, we can do extraordinary kind of revolutionary things. So I, I think for, for us, it was a little bit of a hinge from some of the empathy and some of the thinking, which I think I see that pendulum swinging back and forth, but to this very direct making experience. And yeah, that's what I think about. Terrific, thank you. And Laura? The aughts. From I hinge to where aughts. do you go from hinge? <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> You, everyone has these crossroads moments in their lives, and uh, mine was when we were working on the master plan, so Bob and Linda were both on the urban design project team. I was working at the Conservancy, and Bob says, you know, really what you're doing is urban planning. You should go back to school. And I said, you know, I've been out of school for like eight years. I'm already on a career path. And I said, that sounds really exhausting. And he said, you can sleep when you're done. <laughs> that I still haven't slept, so he's kept me busy in every way, shape, and form. So at that moment, he basically opened the door for me to have a set of uh, tool, tools in the toolbox for planning that I never would have had if I didn't go to school. Uh, is Samina Raja here? So w when you go to methods, and, and you know, for me, it was I had been out of school for a long time, and. Uh, I didn't have a lot of math background, and you go in, and, and uh, she just scares the ever-living heck out of you the first day. You're just paralyzed by fear. But she, uh, the shepherding through methodology and understanding quantitative and qualitative analysis, those are tools I use every single day. Um, and the how to think and how to problem solve was um, just something, the tools in the toolbox that I got out of this program are things that I look for in, you know, as we're doing hiring with the Institute and um, things that we are constantly reinforcing. We have a lot of uh, people who came through the program. So um, as the next generations come through and there's new tools emerging, uh, we're always using and going back to that toolbox. So I, I think it's sort of a reflection of all of those things. It's combining all of those things. I, I definitely think the how to think, not what to think, but how to think has been uh, an integral part of the school's thinking and, and throughout the evolution of the school, and I'm sure it will continue. Thank you. And um, with some pride, we introduce you to what we hope will be one of our first PhDs soon <laughs> um, uh, with a full history of the school. So you've seen quite a lot in, <coughs> and actually probably spent more time in school than everybody <laughs> else on this table. Yeah. So talk to us, Molly. Sure. So I think, um, and I've actually transferred back to UB two times um, because I just love so much about the program here. And I think one of the really valuable things during my experience was the ability to work on real projects. The first studio project that I worked on was looking at Canal Side as they were first putting up um, the historic signage in 2007. And then to see kind of the problems we identified with the space at that time and how it's unfolded over the last decade is pretty spectacular. Um, taking a course with Dr. Raja about research methods as an undergraduate student and being pushed to identify and work on a real problem in the community 
Again, I was looking at um, <clears throat> housing for LGBT homeless youth and homeless people in the LGBT community. And just this year, Evergreen Health Services put up the first LGBT housing development in our city. So really knowing that things we look at are larger problems in our community. As an MUP and PhD student, my um, studio was looking at adventure tourism in Ellicottville, seeing a lot of the progress that's been made there. Um, I worked with Carrie Trainer on um, a nomination for the Central Park neighborhood for the National Register. Again, a real project. Um, my thesis, which informed my dissertation, which was supported by Dr. Taylor, the first person who really saw value in that topic and provided me mentorship. And then um, the graduate assistantships I had as a master's student and a PhD student have been by far the best experiences during my time in the school. I worked with Beth Tauke, um on um, grant applications, real papers, my time at the Idea Center working with Ed and Jordana, um, working on complete streets projects, housing for wounded veterans and paratransit issues, and working with Dr. Silverman at the Center for Urban Studies on community benefit agreements. So it's a whole lot of different experiences, but I really appreciated that everything was tied to a real issue and that this work really informed what was happening locally in the community. So those are snapshots, um, clearly not everything, not even comprehensive. I bet there are some core pieces decade by decade that some of you might have some additional observations to make. We have two folks with microphones on either side, and we have a first generation decade to talk here, please. You got the mic? She's coming. If you hold your hand up, the mic person will find you. I am. Try it again. I'm Dan Schimberg. I was here, uh, overlapped with Rowan in 72, 73. Uh, I want to just amplify two of the points he made about systems thinking, which informed everything from the, from the beginning and carried over when I made a career transition 30 years ago to IT. I'm now an information technologist, and every day those system thinking tools uh, come into play, and unfortunately I don't touch the built environment. They're all virtual environments, they're all software, but the tools are the same. Uh, the other point I wanted to make that <coughs> uh, Dean Shibley sort of mentioned is the involvement of students in the curriculum, which you mentioned early on this morning, but um, throughout those beginning years, we met with the chairman and the dean and the faculty, and the students were helping to shape the curriculum. I hope that still goes on. Thank you. The one thing that I didn't actually talk about is that there was a lot of work going on with the people. I mean, a lot of the things we did at Building Science, again, they did at Bosti, and I, I'm hearing it down the line, so it wasn't, that was not something new. We had actually spent a lot of time doing a lot of projects at Building Science. You got anything, Larry? Yeah. Hi. Larry Brown, Class of 73. Uh, my experience to working with a new school of architecture carried on throughout my entire career. After uh, graduating from undergraduate B. Arch degree here, I went on to Penn State, got a master's degree. Then I went on to uh, start a school of architecture with the Rutgers University system. And I believe the experience and seeing how a whole program got underway, both pedagogically as well as structurally was very, very important in, in those years. And then later on in my business career, there's a lot of experiences that came out from yeah. UB, the thinking and looking at alternatives without getting emotionally involved, but being able to bring in an intellect to <laughs> looking at alternatives and finding alternatives to alternatives was very valuable throughout my career. And I ended up with a, uh, and I'm now retired, but uh, a firm of 66 people out of Boston doing health care. So it served me well. Thank you. Thank you. And congratulations on Rutgers. That's a program that has matured over the years and, and delivers a fine effort. Folks in the middle years, anybody? 
So the, 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 the apparent observation here is that some of those early seeds that take you to whole other places like IT at a time when you were still pulling things through punch cards is, is an interesting bridge and still crediting those early uh, kind of origins to it. Thinking about the pedagogy of the school and a relationship between a, a sister school like Rutgers and our own program and how that evolves adds additional value to this whole piece. Mm -hmm. So, so because we're taking just the cream off the top and going to go deeper into the smaller breakout sessions, let's go back around very quickly and see if you can think about, in terms of your current work, uh, and some of you started to touch on this, but where does your time here intersect with what you do now, and is there a relationship between the two? Almost everything. I mean, I, after I left here, I worked for a few years at, at Cannon, and then I went to New York, decided I didn't want to do health care anymore. Went back to school, went to Columbia, and got a degree in architecture and urban design, and most of that, most of the stuff that we did in the urban design program was analytical work, and spent a lot of time doing that. The first project I did as my thesis, and then I did it for real, was Battery Park City. And all the, all the designs that were generated from Battery Park City had to do with the way we thought about Battery Park City. The first few experiences with Battery Park City was done by a lot of name architects, and they all got it wrong. Um, and what we did is we took a look at what was down there, we analyzed what was down there, we analyzed the connections and how they came together and what we wanted to do. I did something similar to that when I was at Perkins Eastman. We were the only American firm hired to uh, submit for the Shanghai Expo, which we did. And they took about 60% of that and brought a Chinese architect in to finish it. But even then, when we were looking at Expo, we found things like a subway that they were going to close down. And what we did when we analyzed that is realize that subway connected to the majority of the people in Shanghai. So they kept it open. And those kinds of elements and those kinds of things that you study continue and have continued. I'm doing a project right now in Mumbai, which is a redevelopment project, 18 acres in, uh, in South Mumbai. And everything that was developed with that was done from the analysis, understanding not just the architecture, the, the economy, the sociology. You're not designing a, an American city when you go to India. So we talk about this, but we're not talking about the other elements. It's not just architecture. It's all of the, all of the sub elements that one looks at. So that was the beginning of understanding you're not the only man in the game. And I think that was what John really brought to us, is that you really have to take a look at that. I do a job now, I did a city, just finished the city in Saudi Arabia that was for a million people. We had 18 consultants in there. So I don't pretend that, that we knew all that stuff. It was a team of people that brought things together. I think that's one of the things we have to do in the future is how architectural schools work and whether they stand alone or they start integrating with other areas. Nice. I'm, I'm struck by how sitting next to you is planner and architect from two generations following it, who brought us today a description of kind of the empathy and its role in what is essentially an analytic set family of tasks and the kind of craft of making as a component of that. Did those both have origins or cross sections in your current work? Either one of you, start. Um, I mean, I love your response. The very first thing that he said was everything. <laughs> everything that I'm doing right now really is traced back to here. I've been thinking about that a lot lately because, again, people have been asking me, how are you doing this? <laughs> and, and I, you know, one, one aspect of what I do with computer development and software systems design, I keep getting patents. And, and that means that you're looking at something in a unique way. And it's like, well, how am I looking? Why? And I realize it's because I have spent time, it, which seems very obvious to me, and it's because it was, I was taught it here. Just understand who's using the system, how they're using it, why they need to use it, what are their needs, and come up with a variety of different ways of solving that problem. And through that, um, that's where creativity lives. I do, I do want to say one other thing. We talk about what we're doing in the built environment. Well, I build a lot of the buildings that are on those sites, too. So Bendy Bazaar, we have 10,000 units of housing. We're doing 2 million square feet. And 
we're building it. So it's not just understanding the plan, it's then taking the plan the next steps. Mm -hmm. We might design guidelines for those plans and how they're controlled. Sometimes they don't work, but it takes it through all the steps. It's not just here's planning, here's architecture. It's an integration of both, and that's what I thought was important. So, Roland, this might be a conversation with you and Michael to, to help with the architecture side of it as we mm -hmm. come back around to planning more. But in that conversation, Michael introduced himself as a hinge that right. really went narrower and deeper into the kind of culture of making, the material conditions and tectonics associated yeah. with them, yeah. those things, as a core part of his education. That was also the, a core part of my, I mean, we had to, to well, get into the urban design department at Columbia, you had to have at least an architectural degree. You couldn't right. even get into the urban design right. program because you have to know how to build. You have to understand the building typologies. So a critique so, of those early years is we didn't concentrate it enough on building, and you're saying we did? And well, we, well, we did because most of the people in our class, and Larry, you can shout out here too, already had some background in architecture. So they were, we were taking the traditional classes. I mean, we also had things like, I was thinking about it, we had a guy named Monte English and we did 3D and we actually were taught welding and we were mm -hmm. cutting things and we were doing all kinds of crazy stuff. We were also doing renderings. We even had uh, Murray Silverstein, who, I don't know if everybody knows who Murray Silverstein is, um, pattern language, Christopher Alexander, he was one of the authors, came and actually taught a class on that. So it was, it was taking it to every level. Nice. It would have been nicer if it was longer and we had more time, but. So does that still work with the hinge or is there another facet of I making? I think it was substantially different for our generation, I mm -hmm. really do. Um, and, uh, and I think one thing that you slowly learn as you get out of school is a little bit of humility. So now I can say, I think at that time we were exclusively focused on making and seeing and touching things. And I think now, you know, I think I had a two hour conversation with Professor Price just shortly ago about the history of the East Side and some work that I'm doing down there. And also we have students who are just graduating and joining the firm that work under me who are very concerned with issues. Um, you mentioned that word. Those were not what we were looking at during our, we were reading Deleuze and Guattari, we were cutting blocks of wood, we were, you know, very deep into making things. And, and I do think that that was, although I think older professors at that time might not have loved that that was our singular focus and that we weren't looking at other things, I think that time in undergrad to just make things and just do those type of things was extremely important to me. And I think that's actually why I've been able to lead collaborative teams, collaborative multidisciplinary teams for about 20 years now is because the focus that I bring to everything is what are we doing? What are we making? What's the proof? Show it to me. Show, show me what it looks like. And mm -hmm. I think that's been very valuable. I don't think that is a uh, practice in itself. I think you have to expand from there and bring in other viewpoints, but it's been very helpful to me. Great. It's helpful. Um, um, just fair warning, none of these folks got to rehearse, and so neither did our chair, Omar Khan, and our chair, uh, Ernie Sternberg. Is Ernie in the room? Professor Sternberg? No? Oh, that's too bad. Omar, you're here, yes? All right. So we're going to come back around to you and ask, given this, so what for architecture going forward? And I might ask Bill Page or a few others from planning to offer some observations from that too. So that's as much homework as you're going to get for today. So sorry about that. <laughs> Let's return now to the, the latter generations, the last two decades. Uh, again, clearly with a planning bias, but nonetheless a kind of in the school and in the culture of the school. And if you can think about things you took away that actually have now affected your daily practice. I think um, what strikes me now is, and at the work of the, the Regional Institute, we cover so many topics, and people will say, well, how can you be good at all those different topics? And it, it, it goes back to the toolbox and how to think. So you can have a sustainability lens, you can have an economic development lens, you can have an equity lens, you can have all of those because of the tools that, that we uh, bring to the table through, through um, the continued research and the continued evolution of our relationship with the school. I mean, the institute being uh, in, within the school really is a great benefit because we're always uh, challenging the thinking and um, uh, sort of 
pushing on issues with each other and saying, what if we looked at it like this? And I think uh, with that, it, I talked about using the core toolbox every day. We do, but it's but the ability to use that across the lens of so many different topics, I think, is one of the things that is valued in the community and the reason that the institute has gotten to do such incredible work in the, in the community. It, um, it's that how to think part is what what people value within the school, and I think. Um, not just in Buffalo, but across the world, I think people uh, see the value of, of that using that toolbox across the lenses. Sure. So I work, I just started a new position down at Erie County Senior Services in June, so my first full-time job. Um, and we've had a lot of leadership transition. So within the first month that I worked there, I think three out of our four supervisors moved out of the department to new positions. So it's been in flux and um, as being new and as part of my role, I've been given more responsibility um, and been asked to step up. And one of the things I've really taken away from my time here is how to be a leader and how to be a mentor, learning from the faculty that I've worked with. It's about being accessible and kind, um, an open door policy, being authentic, really listening. Um, these are some things that I've been using as I've been fulfilling a new role down there. Wow. So let's take this to you, Omar, for a moment. Just, uh, you know, clearly we've been on a five-year, six-year trajectory of uh, working together collaboratively, thinking about the school as a whole, but also the discrete enterprises that are vested in architecture and in planning. And as you listen to this, do you see a common thread through history, or are we at another hinge point in some fashion? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's, uh, you know, uh, this question, I think when, when uh, we started this discussion, this question of a paradigm shift, or mm -hmm. there was a paradigm that was laid. Uh, and I think there are moments of that that happen, and I think when I think about how Mike is talking about uh, that time, because that was sort of when I was also in school, and um, uh, the paradigm had shifted away from systems thinking, uh, partly because of uh, uh, a sense that uh, one was too far removed from the kind of uh, direct experience, uh, the experience of the material, the experience of the engagement with that. And, and I don't f uh, see at the moment that there is necessarily a paradigm uh, that's exercising, although I would say that climate change is probably the closest thing we have as something that's exerting uh, some notion of a, of a paradigm uh, on us. And within the department, what I read, uh, because what we, I think, did, and you know, I'll speak to this actually in the, in the breakout session on research is, um, in 2007, you know, we started these research groups. That's how we organized our graduate program. And part of that, I think, was a response to actually not being paradigmatic. Uh, in some ways, saying there are interesting problems and there are different ways of handling them. And even though we do have, let's say, a group that deals directly with ecology, I would say every single other group from the group that's dealing with inclusivity to uh, situated technologies, to materials, to, to urban design. Uh, they're all dealing with this larger environment. And I, th I think that's maybe um, what, what uh, I'm sensing more is that there isn't an overarching paradigm to align oneself. So neither are there methods. I think they're far more diverse and probably far more uh, rich in that way. And, but this tradition, uh, I think, uh, this school represents in many ways that, that uh, pendulum, as was described, but um, where, where systems theory may, may feel that it has some um, claims on uh, ways of explaining the world as a connection or an interaction of systems, of, of different systems. What I think the material approach did was that it actually brought subjectivity into uh, the conversation, and, and that's extremely important because uh, the, the simplifying things, I mean, and I'm not suggesting that systems theory is anyway simplistic, uh, but you know, in some ways thinking of people as systems also had its, its problems. And so I think materi this, this uh, move from materiality was very important uh, within the 90s 
Um, and, but I do think right now we are seeing uh, uh, everybody trying to figure many things out. Uh, and uh, I think the, the schools uh, uh, positioned itself very well. I, I, the other things I, I enjoyed very much about the conversation is this real world engagement. That's something that I think is um, profoundly true about this school uh, in terms of how we deal with this city. Uh, and, uh, and in the material way we deal with it, the way we deal with it in policy, the way we deal with it in terms of just community engagements, uh, as a school that uh, sees itself uh, not just uh, isolated but within the kind of context of Buffalo. I think that's a, a, a profound thing that probably across the generations has always been uh, here. And so that continues very, very strongly. Uh, and uh, I'm very happy to be part of that. Terrific. That's actually really helpful. I mean, you can imagine a kind of a systems thinking. We then went to empathy and the material conditions that Michael started to frame. And then here, we're into both tool using and then over time, leadership uh, related to perhaps a kind of tool making, which is where Omar was beginning to suggest. So you don't have to dispute any one of those phases to understand a relationship among them but none of them are in and of themselves formative. That is to say, we are not trapped in history, but we learn from history. And the, the evidence base and the performance base tied to climate change is one element of significant external force that we don't control, but can engage in a different way. I'm going to try something just slightly differently because I don't have Ernie Sternberg, who is our chair in planning with us. I'm going to ask Bill for you to reflect a little bit on the direction of planning education in the context of this discussion. And then I'm going to come back around for one of our early uh, chairs in our program and ask David Perry for a little reflection on the same thing. Now you have a warning. <laughs> Bill. Um, yes, I, th I think this discussion was very helpful. and. I see what's happening in the field of planning is incorporating many of the things discussed. Uh, certainly the, the goal of planning or the main activity of planning is really focused on making plans that have to be comprehensive, comprehensive plans and certainly systems thinking is a big part of understanding that. It seems to me that one bit of a difference is that the field of planning is, is focused you know, 20, 30 years into the future. And it really is not doing things themselves. There's a toolbox of how to help a community come up with a plan, but it's not that the planner is sitting down with these tools and crafting something as much as they're working with the community to get a vision of what they want the future to be like and how to make a community better and lives better in the future. So that, that sort of future orientation um, and collaborative nature of the process strikes me as a little bit different than some, in, some of the architecture work, but yet it is still crafting a plan, getting all the people to agree on the goals and the process and the best ways of doing it and, and getting that agreement to move forward in a coordinated way that is the process in planning. And I see that it, it you know, the focus shifts a little bit, you know, it's sometimes they're focused more on fair, fair share of housing in a community and other places are working on economic development as the goal or dealing with climate change, but it's always how to make the future a better place and how to get there. And I think that's what I see happening. Thank you. In 1982, one of the things that motivated me to come to Buffalo um, uh, was um, the fact that I was coming jointly with a new chair in planning and a brand new program in uh, design studies. And uh, that chair is here with us. He just walked in. He's stone cold, so he's not prepared, as I had suggested before. Nor uh, would I ask him to do much other than we had a sense about who we were as, as far too young chairman in an in a, in a, in a, in a academic institution like this and how we might move forward. But there was also a sense of certain financial distress in our unit and a way of understanding how architecture helped planning and how planning helped architecture mature. And, and together we could do things we couldn't do by ourselves. Now there wasn't a lot of joint scholarship across this spread, 
but there were some pretty interesting conversations about how architecture and planning shared a kind of kinship, not always so obvious. Uh, and um, I would say that that's still a pregnant idea, not fully delivered, but it does seem to me to have some promise when, in fact, Bill Page is one of our lead environmental planners and our chair in architecture says climate change is one of the major conflicts that we're going to have to address in the near term. And it's a very significant paradigm changing uh, kind of concern. And so the common ground gets even clearer to me as, as perhaps something we could project forward on. David comes to us uh, from the University of Chicago after having spent some time with us, had some of origins in the early thinking about how we might frame a, a regional institute on urban issues here, uh, and was um, the godfather of the Great Cities Institute in Chicago. Give us your thoughts by way of closure. You've got about two minutes on where planning might go. <laughs> I have less than two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Howard. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Bob. I, I, want to, I want to thank you very much for this uh, event. Uh, this is a really important building and a really important set of programs. And I can't, I would not miss it. Um, this, the thing I would like to say is that I came to um, uh, the school of, in, in, in Buffalo um, without any training in planning, I am not a planner. I don't profess to be a planner. Um, I try desperately because what had happened was that I decided to move in a relational way away from the power relationship and toward the spatial relationship. And planning is, if nothing else, about the spatial relationship. Space, however, dear architects in the room, is not simply physically produced, it's also socially produced. And we wanted to really tr to try and create a situation where, the where planning and architecture would be relational. And that meant having a relationship with each other. And Bob Shibley helped me create that relationship. Uh, the second thing I would simply say is that planning today is not, is, is, is getting more and more commodified. It's losing a lot of its moxie. In, in, in short, it's become less just about, as Bill, P Bill Page, um, another wonderful chair of our department, uh, uh, pointed out to me many times, and he pointed out to all of you right now, the planning today is economic development, it's housing, it's environment, it's a variety of things. And we call them specializations. But in essence, what we're really talking about is, the, is our new professional development uh, approaches in planning. The relationship hasn't shifted. The relationship between architecture and planning continues today and it's embodied in our dean. Bye-bye. Thanks, Dan. So colleagues, um, I would like to give this panel a round of applause for their courage in this movie. Don't get up yet. Um, we are uh, going to continue. You'll have, um, I think we'll probably give you a full 15 minutes of break because some of this is just the social construction of our relationships in the room. The next, the next convening then will be about um, um, maybe another 10 to 15 minutes from now, about 5 to, t to 2. And we will be convening in 403 on the subject of acritic rights. And here we'll get a chance to look inside and under the hood of some of the historical and theoretical foundations of our work here. The second uh, session will occur in room 401, just across the hall. And it will focus on ecological commitments in 401 is ecological commitments. And then in 402, also just across the hall, is a look at international experiences in design education. All three of these, just pick one, are an opportunity to dig a little deeper on the themes that have been introduced and place them in the context of those areas. Thank you all for being here. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon.